Hello everyone, my name is Jen and welcome to The Book Refuge. So today we are doing my week 22 wrap up, which was a little bit less than normal, but you'll see with some of the books I had, um, some physical books I was reading, which does tend to slow me down a little bit, as well as one very, very large fanfic that took me about a whole week to get through. So that slowed me down just a little bit as well. But also, I'm sure you can see my lovely um, Gryffindor lion in the back. This is my most recent cross-stitch project that I worked on, and I'm obsessed with it. I'm obsessed. So we're going to show it off while I do the wrap up this week because man, did I work hard on this and I love getting to show off what I do a little bit. So first off, we do have some new supporters to uh, call out. Um, I have two new patrons to welcome. There's Candace and Gianna M. I think that's how G Gianna, Jean, Gina, I'm not 100% sure how you pronounce it, but thank you so much for your support on Patreon. And then we have Stacy M, who has joined at the Dedicated Diva level on my channel memberships. And Stacy, thank you so much. As I said, week after week, and I will continue to say week after week, thank you to everyone who supports me. Any level of support helps so much. Even you just watching this, liking this video, comment, you know, about one of the books that I'm talking about or a book you want me to read. Um, all of that stuff helps me in big and small ways. So I appreciate it so much. But let's go ahead and get into the books. Like I said, I don't have as many as normal to talk about. I think I only have eight to talk about today. Yeah, I think there's just eight. But uh, yeah, we're going to get into them. So the first one that I finished was How to Win the Girl by Sarah Nay. Um, as you guys know, I was supposed to have an interview with Sarah Nay. She was under the weather last Sunday, and I'm not sure when we'll have this rescheduled for. I'm going to try to get it in June, but I'm not sure because now I am pretty busy on the weekends for the rest of June. In fact, um, this week and next week are the only weeks that I'll be able to film my wrap up at the normal time because um, I have some fun stuff happening which is great I love that I have places to go and things to do um, but that means that I'm not going to be home as much to do live shows and such right but this is her most recent release this is book two and I think it's called like campus legends or something like that um, or the, is this the one that's gonna be about the brothers I'm not sure see I hadn't read the first one in this one um, you'll know I'd been reading some of her books in weeks previously to prepare for this but I hadn't read the book before this one because I didn't have time and she had sent me an arc of this one so this one is about Drake and Daisy and their relationship is kind of interesting because Drake is a twin and as twins, they trade spots with each other sometimes. And in this one, um, Drake first meets Davey when, Daisy when he's undercover as Drew in one of Drake's classes. He goes to his class for him um, and they meet and they don't hit it off that great. Then they end up meeting in a dating app and um, he still pretends to be Drew on the dating app. So... The heroine is seeing very different aspects of Drake because she's seeing him pretend to be Drew in class, but then he's also pretending to be Drew on this dating app, well, but like acting like himself. So then when she'll see Drake in person again, he will like not pretend to be the same and then she'll run into the real Drew. So it's one of those where I did think it got a little overly complicated and also the hero lies for such a long portion of the book. And this was kind of the same issue that I had with, was it hard pass or hard fall? Where like the lie just goes on for too long into the story. And so by the time the hero like says it we're like you carried this on too long so that can be a little bit off-putting but overall i really enjoy like listening to the audiobooks of sarah's books and they're definitely some good like mindless fun and yeah i've i don't ever like dread them is that a good way to say it? i don't know um but they aren't ones that i will probably like reach for first before other things so i'm just being honest about it but you know what still had a fun time and I'm glad that I was able to read an arc of that one. So I did give it a three 
Um, but it was a three of like, I would still recommend it in certain situations, right? There's kind of a difference between those. And it was a two on the spice scale. Next, I read the badge, um, which I had on my TBR for May after meeting Lena Hendricks at um, North Iowa Book Bash. And I want to read through her Redemption Ranch series. I have a signed copy of this, obviously, um, because I was very intrigued by the premise of this. And I actually really like these vintage covers she made for these. There are still the man covers of these if you want them, but I actually really like the vintage covers. Um, I normally lead, f like, reach for a couple covers first, but. I like this one. So yeah, this story is about um, Valor, who is a police officer, and she uh, sees a scenario that puts her in danger, and there also is the loss of an officer during this event, and so she is put on like administrative leave. And then when they're supposed to be clearing her to go back to work, they actually don't clear her to go back to work, and they tell her, we want to send you to this place it's not called Redemption Ranch, Montana, but that's what it's called by the locals and the people who live here. And what it is, is it is actually a WITSEC location. Um, that is this ranch. That is a functional ranch. And the two agents who run it, they've been FBI agents for a very long time. It's a married couple. And they have both, um, they have some agents and officers there, um, as well as there are people who need to be in witness protection. And we have Evan Walker, who is there with his younger sister, and he actually used to be a part of the mafia. He wasn't a, like, head of anything. He was more of a grunt work, and he was kind of drawn into the mafia because of his older half-brother. And when some shit goes down, he gets his sister out of there, and they're actually going to turn on um, the higher-ups and so he's in protection until it's time for him to testify and so him and his sister have been living there What adds an extra level to it is that Val and Evan were actually both at The event that like she saw stuff she wasn't supposed to see and he actually took a bullet for her there Like he protected her from getting shot and so when she finds that out She's even like she's very thankful, but she's also very wary of him because she's like I'm at this place and these people are in witness protection, but most of them are criminals. And so she's a little judgmental about that to begin. But I just, I really enjoyed this. I had a great time with this story and the introduction of this place. Um, I have heard that like the alias, which is book two, is a lot of people's favorite. And I'm really intrigued by it because that this next book is actually going to be about the older brother who's a part of the mafia as well and so i definitely look forward to continuing this series so this one i gave a four star it was a two and a half on this spy or three on the spy scale it said really great dirty talk i really loved evan and her the, this relationship like it's definitely a forbidden coupling because you're not supposed to be with anyone that has connections to your past it could be very dangerous uh, but they also just have this crazy chemistry that they can't deny and so we see what that gets them into while they're there. So yeah, I really enjoyed this. I definitely recommend, and I look forward to reading more in the series. Then the last book that I actually read in May, um, before I did my monthly wrap up, which is available already, I read another book by an author from the North Iowa Book Bash, <clears throat> and that is Most Eligible Billionaire by Annika Martin. Now, I actually have had this book for a while because I found it at a local bookstore. Um, Annika Martin is actually from Minnesota, where I live for many, many years. I live in North Dakota now, literally just across the border, like less than a mile from it. Um, and so she's considered a local author to us, basically, you know? Um, and so when I found out she was going to be at the North Iowa Book Bash, I was really excited because I actually own some of her books. So this one was really cute. Actually, I had a great time with it. It has a really interesting setup, though. So there's Vicky who is a dog whisperer, which even she agrees she's not a dog whisperer and she's not even really a scammer for how this happened to her, but she put on an act at a local like fundraiser and she pretended to be a dog whisperer just for this event. And there happened to be this grouchy old lady and her little puppy, um, her cute little puppy 
who, um, you know, for the show, she was pretending that she could talk to the dog. And then this old lady became attached to her and wanted her to be her full-time dog whisperer. And she's like, I don't have time to do this, but the lady ended up offering quite a bit of money and her and her sister needed this because um, she actually has a younger sister that she looks out for. Now, there's also kind of a scary past that our heroine has. There's some stuff that she lived through and survived that um, has made her have to change her name and have a new identity. But it is this like threat looming over her head if people were to find out about this um, secret that she has. And this becomes a bit of a tricky situation when the owner of this pup dies and actually leaves 51% of the family company to the dog and leaves Vicky as the dog's advocate. And so then we have um, Henry, who is the uh, son of this woman who died, who just thinks this woman was an absolute scammer and is going to try and do whatever he can to demolish her and get his company out of her hands, who he thinks is a scammer. And so one of his, I think it's his younger brother, I think it's the younger brother, encourages him to try to seduce her to, you know, while they try to find out information about her. So, yeah, that's, that's the setup of this. So this was actually like, it was pretty cute. I listened to the audiobook. The audiobooks are on, um, any play. And yeah, this was, this was, this was a fun way to round out my month. I had a great time with it. All right. Then we started our books in June and boy, it's been a bit rough so far in June. We started with Bound by Cara Claire, which is a book I was very excited to read because the author put out this post that had a picture of Shere Khan and said that this was going to be a retelling of the Jungle Book in which our heroine falls for Shere Khan. There were a couple warning flags that I did not see, okay? So I'd never heard of this author before. This photo showed up on my Instagram feed and I saw that the book would be coming out soon and I pre-ordered it, all right? I had some um, credits and I pre-ordered this, this bitch here. Um, and then it got postponed once but I still got it and I read it basically the day that it came out and I was catfished hard. Now, again, I think I maybe did miss a couple of signs. Number one, on this author's bio, it says that she writes paranormal reverse harem. And when I have went back and looked, most of the posts for Bound have the why choose hashtag like at the very end of it, but nothing in the blurb indicates that this is an RH or that there will be more male love interests than just Shere Khan. Okay. The blur, nothing in the blurb says that the only hints that this should have, that I should have known this was a Y choose was those hashtags in on the posts and the fact that the author says she's a paranormal reverse harem. But I don't know. I still think you owe it for each book because you know, the advertising for your book may reach more people than your normal readers. I feel like you still owe it to your readers to put that. Like, why in the title wasn't it said a reverse harem retelling of The Jungle Book? Because that would pitch itself to a lot of people, but it would also warn the people off who don't want that. So, first off, when I opened the book, I then was taken aback that, surprise, this is part one of a duet. There also was no indication before the day of the release that this was going to be a duet. The second book was not announced yet. It didn't say that there'd be more than one. And y'all know, I've talk, talked about that ad nauseum. I hate, I hate surprise duets or trilogies or series. If I, even if I'm going to start a first book, if I know there's going to be multiple books, then I'm mentally prepared. If I'm choosing to still read this, knowing that another book might be months away, that's on me. Okay. And I will take that cliffhanger on the chin. But I opened the book and it said, surprise, there's going to be a second book. Literally a book that I pre-ordered and paid for already. It said that. And I should have returned it right then. Okay. I should have just said, you know what? If I return it now, I'll get my money back because I'm not going to have a good time with this. Um, particularly when in the prologue, it talks about a couple of other characters. And then I started to get worried. And so I went to Goodreads and sure enough, the reviews were saying that this was a reverse harem. But then I felt a bit obligated 
because I know that some of my viewers were also excited for this book based on me having it on my TBR and based on me like hyping up that hey this is going to be a share con retelling of the jungle book and for that I apologize to you all I apologize to you because I despise this book quite a bit um not you know and I can like a reverse harem so let's be clear let's be clear I am not 100% opposed to a reverse harem but do I like being surprised that it's one no I don't like being surprised that a book has more than two people in it unless you tell me ahead of time and I think that's fair because even though I do like books with multiples in them I have plenty of books that I adore that have more than two love interests in them I don't appreciate being surprised with it um, I don't like that so we were already just racking up not great things about this book and then I actually started reading the book and it does quite a few things that I don't like as well we do a lot of POV shifts where we repeat stuff we've just seen this is something I really really dislike it's why I don't usually love reading books when they're retold from someone else's point of view but it's the exact same story and we don't add anything different well the author was doing this in real time with having a chapter from Gliana's point of view and then a chapter from Shere Khan's point of view and then a chapter from the bear's point of view yes I'm not I'm just getting into who the other characters in this are um and so sometimes we see a scene from literally three different POVs um so that wasn't great um then I just I didn't feel any connection like I did a post on my Instagram that I hadn't seen any like stuff that indicated this would be a romance until 46% in and I hadn't even seen any indication that it would be reverse harem until 60% in um, there was finally some indication that a couple of the other male characters might be willing to share Gliana. Um, but no discussion with her about if she'd be up for that. She hasn't even liked one of the men yet. Um, and so, really, this book just kept spiraling from there for me. Um, uh, there was a random time jump involved. The other characters included Baloo and one of the wolf brothers. You know, so if you know the original story of the Jungle Book, there's the bear. And he's not called Baloo, but, like, his his title does say the bear, um, because he's like a bodyguard slash like someone who um, protects Gliana and he helps her escape from uh, a forced marriage that she was pushed into. Um, and yeah, there's that. And then there's a point in the book where she stays with the, the wolves, which again, um, you know, in the original, like Mowgli is raised by the wolves for a little bit. And one of the wolves who in this they're shifters so that's the thing like all the animal all the all these men are like shifters in some stance like Shere Khan obviously can turn into the tiger the wolf can turn into wolves and I believe the bear must be able to turn into the bear um and they have been kind of messing around together they've never fucked but they've definitely gotten each other off and this is a bad thing because the wolves might have welcomed her in but they would not welcome her as a mate for one of their wolves that would be a big no-no and so you know after a time jump of a year with her living with them then we see that she has been messing around with this wolf but then she needs to leave because she's causing problems and so now we're all trying to find her so we've been introduced to these three men but the only one we know she's had some kind of sexual stuff with is the wolf brother and then Shere Khan shows up and he's on this mission where he's supposed to kill her and he's like bedazzled by her magic the JJ um, and wants to take her virginity and now she's mine even though I've been sent to kill her now she's mine so the whole thing was a hot fucking mess and I really just am so disappointed but I also shouldn't be like I don't want to be but it's like I was lied to like I never would have bought this book and been so pissy about it if I'd known that it was a reverse harem like Jungle Book retelling like I just I wouldn't have picked it up um, and then I would have been even more annoyed if it was going to be two books instead of one. And yeah, I'm just, I'm very disappointed. And part of that might be my fault because I didn't pay attention enough. So fair enough. But I also got to put it on the author of like, I went back and looked. And again, the only indication I saw in any of the posts is that there was a hashtag why choose in the tags of the book. 
I never saw it in the description. I never saw it in the description on Amazon where it said this is a reverse harem paranormal retelling of the Jungle Book. It just focused on Shere Khan and everything. So I think I was lied to about it. So I gave it two and a half stars and um, it was even only like a one and a half on the spice scale. Like there was like nothing that even happened in that at all, um, which I could get over if I felt that there was any romance brewing at all and there wasn't. So anyway. So then we have one of the bright spots of the of June so far, and that was A Crown of Cruel Lies. So this is a uh, book eight in the Fae Guardian series and book two in the season of the elf. And this was a book I was very much anticipating. Now it came out in January, but I was waiting for the audiobook because I've listened to all the audiobooks in this series and I really wanted it. But one thing that I do highly recommend is if you do like these books. I highly recommend you buy them because even the paperbacks, I know some people think it's only in the hardcovers, but even in the paperbacks, there is beautiful drawings. This isn't a special edition. This is just the regular cover. Look, here's Erin. Um, and they're just, they're beautiful. The author does such a beautiful job with these. So yeah, even in the paperbacks, there is artwork inside. So definitely there. But anyway, this one is about Aaron and he is our deaf elf. Um, and in a previous book, it was indicated that maybe one of our, um, heroines previously who has healing gifts, maybe she would be able to heal his hearing because he believes like it is an injury, a curse that could be healed. Um, and he isn't going to be able to fully be a guardian until that gets healed because he's, just not at full capacity right and he does have a lot of like self-hate about his deafness and so I will say that is hard to see but but he has a beautiful journey ahead because um, when he meets his mate who she has been hiding away in the woods and he knows that his mate is near but he doesn't want to bond with his mate until he is fully healed and so he wasn't going to you know, cement their bond. But fate has other plans and she ends up literally falling into his lap or falling to the ground where she breaks both her legs and is now um, pretty much crippled for a short amount of time. And when they first see each other and around each other, their bond snaps into place. And now he's like, oh no, I don't want to abandon her. And we go about seeing how we can heal her and how we can start to work to heal the taint that is everywhere that has tainted the magic and is, you know, the sources of magic are being corrupted and it's horrible. And so the journey that these two go on is so beautiful. I love watching how, um, number one, our heroine actually knows a lot of sign language because she had, I believe it was, she had worked with some people who were deaf before or she'd helped with some students who are, I think it was, she had worked with some people who were deaf, so she knows quite a bit about it. And so begrudgingly, because here's the thing too, because he doesn't plan to be deaf forever, he hasn't done much with learning to communicate. He will write sometimes to communicate, but otherwise he hasn't tried to do anything because he doesn't plan to be deaf forever. So why would he learn how to manage his deafness? But there comes a point in this story where one of them can be healed, either his mate or him. And that's where we see some of the really beautiful stuff happen in this story. And I love it so much. And also when there is finally some love scenes in this one, which are beautiful, um, Trix, our heroine, she loves Aaron's voice, um, which he's very self-conscious about since he can't hear it himself. And she's like, babe, it's so sexy. So he will dirty talk <laughs> to her, um, and only for her and it's beautiful. So I gave this one four and a half stars. Um, and this one was a two on the spy scale. And like I said, there is some ableist language and some self hate in the beginning about this character's disability, but I believe the author put it there to show how he feels by the end and how honestly, um, you know, his mate helps him accept himself. And I mean, cause she completely accepts that about him. And I just, I think it's beautiful. It was wonderful. Okay, then I received a arc of Forgive or Forget Me from Anne Iverson. 
or Ein, Einer, Einerson, um, which was so kind. She sent me um, a signed uh, arc of her new release here. She had sent me some cute little like postcards with it, which was really sweet. And I was very much anticipating this read um, because it has um, a second chance romance. They were childhood lovers, um, very emotional. And those were all the things I was told. There is also a lot of loss in this book, which we know about. Like she had lost her mom to sickness. His father, who he's estranged from, is is dying from cancer in this. And our doctor is actually a pediatric oncologist, which thankfully we don't see any sick kids in this book, but like that's the job that she does. Um, and so we do see one child in here who is in remission, which is really cool. We got to see her. So this book I had very, very high hopes for. And as I said in my Goodreads review for this one, I still would read this author's books again because her her actual writing skills were very powerful. And I was very moved by the story as I don't know who wouldn't be because it's very emotional. But the pacing and the revealing of information was really off for me and it it spoiled a lot of my enjoyment that I could have had from this book. Um, the biggest weakness for me, like the single biggest weakness, which there isn't another one I'll talk about, but the single biggest weakness for me is that as a lot of Second Chance does, so I've seen it done well, there is a lot of flashbacks. There's flashbacks to the 15 years before. The issue that I had with it is that pretty early-ish on into the story, we find out what the hero does to the heroine, like why he's gone. And so I had this sense of dread, right? Every time we go to a flashback, you have this sense of dread because you know we're going to lose the heroine's mom and you know we're going to, that he's going to leave her. And we also, at a certain point, before we ever read that flashback, we learn that the heroine had a miscarriage of their child after he had left her. He never knew about this, um, but he had left her and never checked in on her for 15 years. And the reasonings for his leaving, in my opinion, were paper fucking thin. They were paper fucking thin. And I was really waiting for what such a big event could have been that this man who supposedly loved her so much when they were teenagers and now being back in her life is so, um, like she's mine. Like she was always meant to be mine. Like no one else can be in her life. Like I'm the number one. If you really felt this way, Milo, where were you for 15 fucking years? Okay. So again, I don't want to get too heated about this cause I'm not going to like, mm, mm, mm. but that is what ended up breaking my back with this book is that if I didn't have to see all of those flashbacks and I didn't have to see how good they were together and what a beautiful relationship they had and know that he was going to do that to her. If we had just been in the present time and then the one flashback we had was seeing when it all blew up, I could have accepted it and moved on. But because I saw how the hero was with her when they were kids and to know that he abandons her literally right after her mother dies and then isn't there when she has a miscarriage and then never checks in on her for 15 years and shows back up and is just wants to be like, I know we have a lot of issues, but like, you're the woman for me. I'm like, how do you know? It's been 15 years. You don't know anything about her anymore. And then there's the whole aspect of one of the reasons he's back is not because she reached out. Someone else actually did a bit of meddling to get him to come back. So he wasn't even coming back because it was finally time for him to come back and see her. No, someone else does some meddling. And we discover that um, Milo's father, Mac, who this is in the back of the blurb. I know it seems like I'm sharing a lot, but um, he's dying of cancer. And Milo hates his father because he blames him for destroying his life. And so he's, Milo is then even angrier that this woman he loves, supposedly, is helping the man that he views as the greatest evil in his life. Um, and is so unwilling to talk with him about, you know, any misconceptions he might have. He just fully believes it. Um, 
it made Milo irredeemable for me. And that was the second thing that broke my back. The main thing was, again, if I hadn't seen all these flashbacks and how great he is and all that stuff, I could have just taken what was happening in the present day and watched him kind of have a change of heart. But the fact that we kept flipping back to how much they were there for each other and how he promised to always be there for her when things happen. And she was there for him when his mother died and then he leaves when her mother dies. And never looks in on her at all and had no plans to as far as we could see. And then he wants to come back in and say all these sexy things of like, you're my stardust and like we were always meant to be together. I just call bullshit. I just call bullshit. And so when we had like romantic scenes in the present day, I didn't buy them for a single second. And I really wanted Olivia to tell him to take a hike. I really wanted her to be like, you have done nothing but destroy things in my life and you can go now. And that's not what this story was about. So again, what I did like is I liked the author's writing. I was very compelled and sucked into it. I mean, I made it through this 430 page book, even though it was very angsty and very frustrating to me, her writing pulled me along and I liked that. I just think that the pacing and the choices that she had Milo made, I didn't like them. I really loved Olivia. I loved her. I loved all the, 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 the group of people around her. I loved Mac. I loved Mac. Um, but Milo was irredeemable for me. A absolutely doghouse forever for me. Um, and I can't get behind a book where I think the hero is irredeemable because he's who I'm looking to love. You know, he's who I'm looking to connect with and be with. But as I said, I would read another book by this author that maybe wasn't a second chance with flashbacks in it because I think the writing was very compelling. And I mean, look, this debut book, this is beautiful. So I, you know, and if you're watching this, I hope you aren't watching this because I feel so bad to speak this way of it. But thank you for sending me this. I'm, I'm sorry that I wasn't a glowing review for it, but I really believe in your talent and what you're going to do. Um, and again, like there was a lot of good to be in it, but this story wasn't for me. Like there are a lot of actually glowing reviews for this book, including I think some of you watching. I know some of my viewers have reviewed this book as well and loved it and maybe it's more for them. But y'all know, I have a very thin line for like angst versus like payoff. And for this one, it was completely the like, the angst just dragged the story down. So it's too much for me. So, all right, two last ones to talk about here. And they're both fan fiction. So I also thought it was appropriate to put up my Gryffindor because I was talking about fan fiction. So I finally read Isolation by Bex Chan, which this one is on so many people's top lists, right? You know, there's Remain Nameless, Manacled, um, Breathments of Battle Scars, those ones, and there's Isolation. And Isolation is one I hadn't got to yet because it's a, one of the really long ones, as they all the good ones are. Um, but a lot of my friends are reading fan fiction again. They're going through it. And the next fan fiction readathon will actually be next month, by the way. I'll be announcing the exact dates soon so people can prepare. But I'm wanting to read some more ahead because I'm planning to put out another recommendation video. So I'm trying to let myself read some more, right? Um, and so anyway, Isolation is a sixth year AU. So where this one changes is when um, Snape has to kill Dumbledore. Um, Draco has done something to piss off the Dark Lord, and so he's going to kill him. He's going to kill him. And because Snape has made an unbreakable vow with Narcissa that Draco not be killed or it will kill him, right? He needs Draco to live. So what he does is he brings Draco to McGonagall, who first Snape has to explain everything to McGonagall, like, hey, hi, I know it looks like I just killed Dumbledore, but I didn't. Well, I mean, I did, but Albus told me to do it. Um, and we need to keep Draco alive because if he's dead, then I die and I can't complete the work that Dumbledore wants me to do. And so McGonagall's like, well, I don't know what we're going to do with him. I don't know where we can hide him. So they take Draco's wand, they lock him down, and they end up making Hermione share a like uh, head girl, head boy, or like, I don't know why there's like a guy and girl room. I know it's not supposed to be a guy and girl room, but basically share like a head girl apartment with 
Draco. So like there's two rooms and a bathroom and like a little like kitchenette area. So basically they have like an apartment together within Hogwarts and Draco is not able to leave. If he tries to leave, it's pain. He's not able to touch Hermione's wand because it will hurt him. But Hermione is stuck in this room with him for all the rest of like, um, basically she stays there with him for a really long time. They're together for all this time. And the first like half of this story is their slow burn romance. Okay. And it is a very slow burn. And I actually used, which I'll share this with you. Um, there was this person on Spotify who had the first 18 chapters recorded. They didn't finish the story. They've actually stopped doing fan fiction like narration, but it really helped me get into the story because I was really struggling with just like focusing in long enough. Like that was not the story's problem. It was my problem. And so I listened to the first 18 chapters. So if I remember, I will link the podcast that I listened to that did that because some of the other podcasts didn't even make it like five chapters into this, but that one had 18 chapters and I put it up on a 1.8 speed and it really helped me get through because by the time the narration was done, I was hooked into this. Um, and then I ended up finishing it over the next like three days. So yeah, but it is a very slow burn. And I, what I liked about this one is a lot of the Dramini that I've read fit into a couple categories. One, they are an AU. I mean, they're, you know, they're all AU technically, but they're like an AU that takes place after the fact where, you know, Draco has already like switched sides or it's over and he's paid his time like it fits into those categories or else it's one where he's like on their side from the beginning and it's like a hidden thing but he's on their side the whole time you know think manacled you know there's secrets in there but that type of story what i liked about this one is that draco was scared but he very much is like brainwashed to a certain degree, right? Like he believes the pure blood narrative. He fully believes that Hermione is a stain on like wizardry and all these things. And so he just spews these horrible things to her over and over and over again. And you just start to get so sick of it. But Hermione with her like steadfastness and her like patience slowly wears him down. And as we watch these two fall in love, like I very much believed it because it doesn't happen easily or quickly. Um, and there is a lot of like toxicity in that beginning because there's a lot of fighting and there's a lot of like name calling and Hermione having to forgive him over and over again. And like that can be draining. But at the end of the day, I believed it by the time Draco has to make some real decisions about who he's going to support. I believe it because of him being with Hermione and like, seeing all of that, like I believed it. So this was a great story. I highly recommend it. It's definitely high on my favorites list. So I give this one four and a half stars. As usual, the pacing can be difficult. Um, there are, is some stuff where like we could have cut this out to cut it down, but that isn't something that I like crucify a fanfic for because when an author is writing the story just as it comes to them, you can't always foresee what you're going to need to edit out, you know? So yeah, I enjoyed this. It did have a two and a half on the spice scale, but this is one that's rated mature, not explicit. So like there is definitely a good amount of sex that happens once these two are intimate, but it's not like graphically explained sex. So take that for what you will, you know, like if you really want that, this isn't the most raunchy one you'll find, but it was also very beautiful. There's some very beautiful intimate scenes in this. And there's also some parts in this that are hurt and comfort. And we do so because it's starting like sixth year, we do go all the way through the defeat of Voldemort and we get to see how it happens a little bit differently if Draco were on our side. So yes. And then the last one that I read, which was a fan fiction, I really just finished this one because I was, I had DNF'd a few fanfics and I wanted to push through. Um, but this one was called Smirk at the Fear by Mama Merch. <laughs> and this one is a Lucius and Hermione and it takes place when Hermione is 25 and Lucius is 50 and they end up getting connected because... Lucius is under threat of like a, a lawsuit and Hermione for what her job is at the ministry like they end up working together to talk through that and it turns out that Hermione is a dom 
and he has sub tendencies and they end up getting connected and trying out if they want to um, be together or not. Like it kind of, it, this one isn't a super long fix so it really does kind of move itself along for that pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, it, this one was definitely really spicy, but it also, I should have listened to the warnings. It had some kinks that I don't love. Um, it had some pet play near the end. Um, it is just all pretty much contained to one chapter that you can skip if you want. I don't know why I didn't do that, but it literally involved, um, like, like wearing a muzzle and wearing like paws and Lucius acting like a puppy and you know, Hermione being like, no oh, puppy you better make mama come. And I'm just like, I can't. All right. No kink shame, but I'm allowed to say what icks me out and what doesn't. Okay. If you love that, this could be a great one or you want to experience it, check it out. But I'm still allowed to say what icks me out and be a very accepting person on my channel here. <laughs> but that one was, I should have listened to the warnings, but I was interested to see a Dom Hermione. Um, and for the most part, I liked it, but it just, yeah, it just got a little weird. And then it was one of those two where like Draco has a relationship with, who's he with? I can't remember who his partner is, but he's also a sub. And like, he thought that his father might be a sub. And so he's actually the one who set him up with Hermione. And that, like, you can see my face, that made me really uncomfortable that like Draco knew enough about his father to think his father would also be submissive in the bedroom. And when that information came out, I was kind of like, okay, I need to be done. So yeah, I gave this one a three star, maybe being too generous. And it was a four on the spice scale. And again, yeah, there definitely are lots of kinks in this one, but yeah. So anyway, there is week 22 of 2023 for you. Thank you so much for watching this video. Make sure you like and subscribe and check out the ways you can support the channel if that's something that you're interested in. Thank you so much for watching friends and I'll see you next time.